going through an incredible series for the month of June called Super Vision, where we've been discussing what the Bible says about the spiritual gifts, not just in the sense of what they are, but also in the sense of how we should use them and how we should take care of them. And so we're going to continue that conversation today where this is the conclusion. We're wrapping a bow on it. If you missed any of the messages, they are available on our YouTube channel or our podcast, so you can go back and catch up. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, setting our foundation in 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter the fourth chapter, starting at verse number 10, 1 Peter the fourth chapter, starting at verse number 10. And it reads, I'll be personally reading from the NLT version, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well. So that means there's an opportunity where you don't use them well. But Peter's instructing us to make sure that we use them well. Not just use them well, but use them well to do what? Serve one another. How do we do that? Verse 11. Do you have the gift of speaking? Well, speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Today I want to talk a few minutes of the topic of handle with care. Handle with care. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this moment in time that you preordained for us to be here in your midst. Father, we come here because we want to hear from you. We're in this place because we need you. <laughs> and so our hearts are open to receive what it is that you have to say today. We ask that you speak to our hearts with clarity and precision that makes it undeniable for us and impossible for us to stay the same. Lord, transform us like only you can today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I told you all a little while ago that I got this incredible gift for Father's Day. It's my new Bible, and I love it. It's called a premium Bible. Turn to your neighbor and say, premium Bible. This is not unleaded. This is premium. <laughs> premium actually is a category of a Bible, and so this is my first one. It's, it's literally like four times the amount I've ever paid for anybody. I didn't pay for it. My wife paid for it, so technically I paid for it. But what I'm saying is... <laughs> A little more pricey. So what goes into it? See, see, it's made, it's not made with a synthetic leather. This is, this is real deal leather, okay? It's got the little binding ribbons on the back. And I don't have one ribbon or two. I have three. Three. I mean, but seriously, the paper is made out of a specific material, the font is specific. The typesetting is specific. A lot of craftsmanship goes into creating this Bible. I mean, it's, it, it literally is like a car. It's got a, it's got a brand name and a model name. So this is a Schuyler Bible, Quintel model, NLT version. It's a lot that goes into this. I mean, it's like butter in your hands. I'm serious. If, if you were able to touch it, I'm not going to let none of y'all touch my Bible, but if you were able to touch it, you would feel the difference. I mean, it feels so good, it makes you want to read it. But since I, I, I've gotten it, it's like, man, I'm so careful with it. Like, I, 
I, I keep it in the box. I still have the box because I don't want anything to happen to my Bible. Donovan, he was bringing my stuff up. He was like, do you want the Bible to stay in the box? Like, yes, don't touch it. <laughs> Keep it in the box. <laughs> because of how much I, I value it, I handle it with care. I don't let anybody touch it. I don't even like to sit it out on my desk too long outside the box because something might spill on it or something might stain it or might get bent up. I, I don't want anything to happen because it's precious to me. That's why I handle it the way I handle it. Now, maybe you're not a Bible nerd like I am, and so you're like, oh, yeah, you got a fancy Bible. Big deal, preacher! That's okay. So, like right like right above, next, like the very next level of the experience to getting my first premium Bible, like, like slightly above, uh, was when I had my first child, like right here, like right above it. <laughs> and that, just, just the first one. It's a different experience with the first one. And that first one's in the room today. But here's the thing. I was, I was in full preparation mode when I became a father for the first time. I was reading all the books, trying to listen to all the podcasts, talk to all the fathers, trying to make sure I was ready and prepared for the moment when my son would be born. And then he was born. I remember it like it was yesterday, and it's 14 years ago now, almost 15 I remember it like it was yesterday. And I remember when he was born and they did all the things and then they put him in this, I don't know what it's called, it's like a warming tray for babies. Where they put him in, you know, like the little, where you, where, you, where you keep food warm, but they had it for babies. And I remember I was, I was still holding uh, my wife's leg and I saw my precious child over here by himself. I was like, he can't be over there by himself. That's not okay. So I went over there to be with him because he was so precious and new and delicate. But I was supposed to be holding my wife's leg and she didn't have any feeling in her leg. And so her leg fell down. But I was so focused on this precious gift this beautiful baby boy. Then it gets worse because then all the hospital stuff ended and now we're packing up our stuff and we're getting ready to go home and, and, and we drive to our, our home and then we get this newborn baby in the, in the house and we get my wife in the house and she's still recovering from the childbirth and, and my in-laws, they're there and... Uh, uh, um, and everybody's getting ready to go. And this terror gripped my soul because I suddenly realized that I was going to be alone with this new baby. And so they're getting ready to walk out the door. And I asked them a question, y'all. Where are you going? There's a baby here and me, and I don't know what I'm doing. I was, I was afraid that I would hurt him. I have big hands, and they break stuff easily. And I didn't even know how to change a diaper. So I said, at least, at least, at least show me how to change this diaper, to care for this new special gift and so they took the time, and I was, I was, I was nervous. I'm like, didn't want to use my whole hands. So I was using like four out of ten fingers <laughs> to try to change this diaper because he was precious to me. I didn't want to mess anything up. I didn't want to mishandle him. 
I wanted him to be all that he was supposed to be, so I knew that I had to be careful with how I handled him because of his preciousness. God has given all of us something very precious in the form of gifts. The Bible calls them spiritual gifts. These gifts come courtesy of the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. And he has a certain level of expectation for each and every one of us with how we use them. Now, we spent some time all month talking about what these gifts are. We spent some time talking about on how to identify which gifts you have. But all of that becomes pointless if you don't know that you're supposed to handle them with care. That you're not supposed to use them any old way. You're not just supposed to use them strictly with how you see fit. But the Bible gives us instructions on how we're supposed to handle these delicate gifts of ours. So we're going to spend some time today talking about just that. The first thing that you have to understand on this journey with your spiritual gifts is that you have to embrace stewardship. You have to embrace the fact that the gift came from a gift giver and that the gift giver is actually the owner of the gift. You and I are the stewards or the caretakers or the managers of these gifts. And so anytime there is an owner that has employees underneath them, that owner gets to dictate policies and procedures. And the stewards, they have to adhere to the policies and the procedures or else that owner has the right to say, you get to stay or you get to go. We understand that in our nine to fives. We understand that in corporate America. But for some reason, we, we lose that sense when it comes to the things of God. And I think that the passages of scripture that we opened up with helped us to see that a little clearer. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, God has given each of you a gift. Who gave it to you? God did. You didn't conjure it up. You don't even qualify for it. You can't. Why? Because he's perfect and you never will be. But he still has decided to bless us, to use us, to gift us with gifts from him. God has given it, and they come from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Here's the part you got to hold on to. Use them well. Not use them when you feel like it. Not use them when it makes sense to you. It wouldn't be a spiritual gift if you could be in control. And if you were in control, we all would be a mess as a result of your control. But God is in control, and he has gifted us, and through the apostle Peter, he has told us that we have to use them well, which means that you can use them terribly. You can use them to hurt instead of using them to help. Your gifts can corrupt you instead of develop you if you don't use them well. How do you use your gifts well. First thing you got to do is the rest of that verse. Use them to serve one another. You don't use spiritual gifts to serve yourself. You don't use spiritual gifts to serve your ego. And guess what? You do not get to not use your spiritual gift because the verse says that we're supposed to use them well. Now, we do have the power God gives us 
the ability to decide, make choices in life, some of which is whether or not we do follow this scripture and do we actually use our spiritual gifts. I think this comes back to understanding stewardship. He gave us something that he expects for us to employ. And when we don't employ what he expects, expects us to employ, we are essentially telling God that we know better than he does. Our plan is much more sound than yours, Lord. Because first, I got to get my education before I use these gifts. First, I got to get my family before. First, I got to get my money right. Then I got to start the business. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then I'll use what you've given me to use. That you put in yourself in the seat of owner instead of the seat of steward. And that is a mistake. Maybe you, you've used your gifts and maybe that, that season swallowed you up. Maybe it tainted how you viewed your gift because somebody else used you to get to your gift. And so therefore, you've decided in order for me not to get used again, I'm not going to use my gift. Here's the problem with that. The Bible tells us that everything that we do, we do it unto the Lord. Everybody in this room, including you as a human, everybody in this room, including you, has the propensity to fail. <laughs> but that's why God said that we are a body and that we all need each other. Because if you're familiar with the body at all, the humankind, when there's a breach in one area of the body, the body is so fearfully and wonderfully made that other parts of our bodies go into action to bring healing to the breach. So the trouble when you get hurt, when there's a breach in you, the devil tricks you to move into isolation away from your help. Just because there was an, a parasite in the body over here that negatively impacted you doesn't mean that the whole body is parasitic. It just means that there was a problem there. But God in his grace and in his sovereignty, he didn't leave you alone. He's given you brothers and sisters that are pure. Not perfect, but their motives are pure. Their love is genuine. And when you opt out of the body overall, you miss the opportunity to be made whole. So that's why it's important that we all are doing our part. Because it is not about us. It never was about us. And it never will be about us. The reason God gave us these gifts and gave us the expectation to use them is because he has a plan. He has a kingdom. And he has an agenda that he graciously decided to involve us in. Be clear. He doesn't need not man one of us. He can do anything and everything he wants to do on his own. But grace and love and mercy has allowed us to be part 
participants in his kingdom plan. And thank God he did. Thank God he has elected to use you and I to do his will. That in of itself is a gift. Beyond the gift of prophecy, beyond the gift of helps, beyond the gift of administration, the fact that he chose you, covered you in the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, is a gift. But now on the other side of that, we have a responsibility. And so we embrace stewardship by using his gifts well. In the book of Matthew, there is the parable of the talents where there was a master and three servants. Two out of three servants used their gift well. Two out of three servants heard, well done, my good and faithful servant. But there was that third servant who took the gift that was placed in his hand. A talent is what the Bible calls it, which is a monetary currency of that time. And he literally buried it in the ground. Didn't use it at all. Now, he didn't lose it. He didn't give it away. He didn't throw it away. He just hid it until his master returned. Then he dug it back up and said, look, bam, here it is. Still got it. I ain't lost it. Here it is. Exactly the gift you gave me. Look, I cleaned it up, shined it up, put a little bow on it. Boom. Here's your gift back. What did he hear? What was the result of him not using it? He was banished. And what he had was taken from him and given to one of the other servants. It's not good enough to possess it. And it's definitely the wrong move to not use it. It's an even worse move to bury it where no one can see it. Because God has given us a gift or two, but he has also given us the expectation to steward it, to use it well to serve other people. You got to take some time because you got to understand something. My brothers and sisters, you're now accountable for what you know. And you know the spiritual gifts. And many of you know what your spiritual gifts are. So now you are accountable on whether or not you're handling it with care. Whether you just toss it to the side, pull it out every now and then. Or don't use it at all. You're accountable, just like they were. What are you going to say when the Spirit of God presses you on this issue? What are you going to say when God himself, the Father, you're before him, Jesus is judging, saying, hey, what about these gifts I gave you? What about the instructions I placed on your heart? What did you do with that information. Spend some time just thinking. This past week, this past month, this past year, how have you been using your spiritual gifts? What does that look like in your life? On a scale of one to ten, how active have you been? Because if you read that parable in the book of Matthew 25, the first two, it says, when they got their amount of talents, it said, the Bible says, they immediately left and got to work. There was no delay. They didn't have to double check. So like, okay, Lord, so, okay, 10, like, how much you want me to bring? Like, no, no, no. They already knew the expectation and they immediately went to work. Some of us, we know the expectation. We've heard all the messages. 
We've seen all the scriptures. And yet we've been sitting on our spiritual gifts. And we haven't been using them, which brings me to my second thought. Don't just identify your gifts, but use them. It's not good enough to have head knowledge. You can articulate. You can pontificate. What's another cake? But you can, you can know what the Bible says about spiritual gifts. You can know what your spiritual gifts are. But if you don't use them, then you are wasting a precious commodity. You're not even reaching your full potential as a person. How, how can you reach your full potential as a person apart from the power of the Holy Ghost? You're just basic without him. You don't have no power. You just got thoughts. You have intellect, but no wisdom. You are nowhere near who you could be if the Holy Spirit was in the center of what you were doing. And part of him being in the center of what you're doing is using what he has placed in you. It's a part of your development. It's a part of your sanctification. And so when you just know and don't do, you are leaving yourself shorthanded in this thing called life. And make sure that when you identify these gifts that you're using the Bible. I don't know if this person is here, but somebody told me, I said, hey, what's your spiritual gift? And they said they had the, the gift of craftsmanship. I said, the what? The, the gift of craftsmanship. They had took a test online and it told them that they had the gift of craftsmanship. I said, um, I'm going to need you to go read 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. Those are the spiritual gifts. Craftsmanship's not in there. That's okay. We're all on a journey. But I want you to correctly and biblically identify what God said the spiritual gifts are. Now, spiritual gifts can manifest in different forms. You may have the gift of exhortation, but your gift manifests not in preaching. It might manifest in singing. Like when you sing, people get encouraged. So there's different manifestations of the gift, but you need to know what the gift is first before you can figure out how it manifests through you. Does that make sense? And then once you know what it is, you have to use the gift. How do we use it well? The next verse, 1 Peter 4 and 11, it's really gives some really specific examples. Do you have the gift of speaking? Question mark. Well, then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Let's, do, let's go word by word, okay? Okay, do you have the gift of speaking? Okay, here's what you should do. If you feel like you're called to teach, you're called to preach, you're called to do this, that, and the other that involves speaking. When you speak, make sure that you're speaking as though God himself is speaking through you. Do you know what it looks like <laughs> to let God himself speak through you? It looks like this. You open your mouth and simultaneously you do this. Okay, I'm going to do it again. That means that you open your mouth and at the exact same time that your mouth is opening, you do this. You get out of the way. You take all of your human personality, perceptions, biases, and you move them out the way so that God himself can give that individual what they need to hear. You don't mix it. It ain't God and you. No, no, that verse said, as though God himself, it didn't say as though God and you collaborate, 
co-minister. No, 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 no. Get out the way. You and I are vessels. So if we're going to use our gift well, it involves a submission. It involves allowing God to do through us what he wants to do, how he wants to do it. Because we understand the relationship here. It's not us, in this example, speaking to the person. It's God using us to communicate to the person. And the only way God truly and purely uses us to communicate to someone else is when we surrender to him. We cannot get in the way because that's when things become tainted. That's when things become toxic. Because we heard something from God and we didn't think it was good enough, so we add to it. And now you have negatively impacted someone. Instead of edifying them, you've confused them because your word is now confused. Because you mixed it with your ideation when it was already pure, when it came straight from him. Now, this is a discipline. We'll, we'll do this at another time. But when you are speaking on behalf of God, you got to be okay with what he's saying. And sometimes your, your mind said, because he's saying something, and you looking at the person like, I don't think that matches, God. You start to rationalize <laughs> what God is. He's perfect. Get out the way. So if you speak, make sure that you're speaking as though God himself is speaking through you. Another example, do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Again, what is the Apostle Peter telling us? Don't do it in your own strength because helps then turns into pride. I did, I did, I did. Look what I did because I'm so helpful. No, you're so prideful because you did it in your strength instead of doing it in God's strength. When we do it in God's strength, we're doing it from a place of purity. We're doing it from a place of service and we don't need a thank you. We don't need a pat on the back because we didn't do it unto you. We did it unto him. And that's why he gave us the strength to do it. You got to keep it pure is what I'm trying to get you to see. You got to keep it holy is what I am trying to get you to see. And the Apostle Peter says, when we do this and everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. So that means if you don't do it this way, the glory doesn't get to God because it stopped at you. Then you become puffed up. Then you become critical. Then you become judgmental. Why? Because you've got it all figured out. Look at how powerful I am. Slippery. It's dangerous if you don't handle it with the care that it deserves. Romans 12 and 6 says it like this. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Key words, doing. That's the first key word. He gave us the gift with the expectation that we would get to work. And we wouldn't just get to work any kind of way, but we would handle it with such care that everything we did, it would be done well. Excellent. Not halfway, not with an attitude, definitely not with pride. As though Purpose City Church needs you. We do not. All we need is the Spirit of God, and we will have everything we need. So if you think you're doing us a favor, you're doing it wrong because everything you do, you're supposed to do it unto him. Don't do it under Pastor Tyler. Don't do it unto Pastor Ty. Do it unto God. You can keep it. We're going to be okay because this is God's idea. And we are in alignment with God. And if you come in 
Put your gifts, surrender under alignment with God, and everything will be what it's supposed to be. But the millisecond that you think that your gift is some type of resume, some type of business card, you're already in trouble. Go back to the feet of Jesus. Purify your gift. Purify your heart so that everything that we do will be done well. At the end of the day, God gave us these gifts to contribute to his work. Make no mistake about it. This means there are plenty of opportunities to serve. We just have to decide that we're going to actually do it. If you have the gift of helps, you can help all over this month. You can sign up Saturday. We're going to be here. We need help Saturday. All you gift of helps is his. Don't be acting busy. We need help. Your church, your community, no matter what your gift is, there are opportunities. You don't have to front like there aren't. Now, if you call the pastor, like, okay, we only got a couple of those, so. Fair warning. <laughs> but most gifts, there's room, there's opportunity, whether it's in the church or in the community. Use your gifts. Where can we use your gift? First place, obviously, your church. You should serve your church. God didn't give you a gift that didn't include an operation in his kingdom. Now, listen. Church is not the only place, you'll see in a minute, that our gifts can be used, but it is a primary place, not just for usage, but for development and maturity. I was watching a conversation between two uh, uh, Christian artists. They were on a podcast together, and they were talking music and history and business, and, and one of them said, the problem with, with, with music today, and they're talking about not just uh, 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 gospel music, but secular music, they said that back in the day, most of the biggest artists outside of gospel music that went into secular music started in the church. Where else can you be 11 with a gift of singing and get it cultivated and developed? And they were, they were intimating on the fact that we lost pure quality, high caliber music because none of these new artists come from the church. None of them were trained, developed, sat down, told to try again, like you can at the church. Because the church is where you hone in, lock in your craft. It's where you get understanding and wisdom around your gift. It's where you get opportunities to put your gifts into action so that those of you who love to say you have an anointing outside the four walls, which is very, 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 very possible. But out there, you want to take your gift matured. Because if you go out there and flop in the name of Jesus, guess what? They're going to not take your Lord as serious as they could have if you brought your gift to them in a mature form. So the first place to serve is to serve your church. Next is you want to serve your family. Yeah, because your family is your first ministry. Like, don't, 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 go, don't, don't go straight to flyers and Facebook lives and your family toe up. Kids don't like you. Wife can't stand you. But you're on live like, I see y'all. Yeah, come on in. Come on in. But tonight we're going to talk about you need to end the live. Go watch a movie with your kids. Because you need to, you need to minister to your home. Your gifts aren't just for churches. But God has given you a gift if you if you have the gift of helps and help clean up the house, man. You got the gift of administration. Why don't you plan the next family vacation? Use your stuff for the edification of your family. Because God created a family before he created a church.
in addition to your church and your family. Use it at your job. Use it in your business. We being entrepreneurs, there were countless decisions that we made based on the leading of the Holy Spirit through the use of our spiritual gifts that didn't make business sense. You know how many deals we turned down in our business because of what the Spirit of God put on our hearts. We had more no's than we said yeses. We lost more money than we received. And yet we had no lack. And yet we were incredibly influential. And yet we accomplished the mission that God had for us. Why? Because we were led by the Spirit. We used our spiritual gifts in the formulation and in the execution of our businesses. And you should do the same. Again, your spiritual gift ain't just for the church. It's for the church. It ain't just for the church. You're not only supposed to be led by the Spirit on Sundays at 1030. It's seven days a week, 24 hours a day that you can call on, use, be in alignment with the Spirit. And part of that, you spend more time at work than you do at church. So how are you not going to use your gift there? You got suicidal co-workers, but you don't know because you ain't tapped in. Because you're so busy getting that spreadsheet together. Do your job. The Bible talks about that. But, however, comma, why are you there for them 40 hours? What is the Spirit of God saying? How does he want you to show up in those spaces? How does he want you to show up on those college campuses? How does he want you to show up in those school hallways? You're supposed to be a light. You're supposed to be salt. You can't get there. You can't get there without the Holy Spirit. And he put those gifts inside of you because somebody on your job needs to be encouraged. Somebody on your job needs to know that there's a man named Jesus that could change their lives forever. Somebody on your job needs to know, thus says the Lord. Somebody on your job needs you to pray for their sick baby. We have a harvest all around us. The Bible says that the workers are few. The workers are few. The workers are few. The harvest is all around us, including at your job. Tomorrow, hello. Next is your community. person on your left and on your right of your residence, they could use your spiritual gift. There's people all around us. We frequent certain places on a regular basis. I pull up to Starbucks, they know my name. Huh? Oh, you want, the, yeah, 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 I do. Thank you. It freaked me out one time. I pulled up to the driveway. They said, hey, Talon. I'm like, hold on. How you know it was me? I ain't even said no order yet. But we go to certain places so much that they know you. They know you, but they don't know you. They don't know what's in you. They don't know the power that you hold because you haven't used it. Stop letting it be situational in the sense of you pick and choose. Instead, let it be situational in the sense of no matter what situation I'm in, my gifts are available to be used by you, Lord. Do what you want to do through me in every situation, every room I find myself in. I'm available, Lord. We talk about all these places, but here, it's, it's not going to mean anything. Listen, hear me. It's not going to mean anything if you don't serve with humility and love. You can serve here, you can serve there, you can serve here, you can serve everywhere. But if there's no humility and love involved, then you're not doing what the Bible says, using, using it well. Your gifts, as we started this journey, learning, your gifts are given for you to serve somebody else. 
Not just, there's a difference between use on someone else, because that's still pointing back to you. I'm going to use my gift on you, and maybe that'll conjure up some influence. Maybe that'll conjure up some favor later on. No, no, no. You're not just supposed to use your gifts on someone. You're supposed to serve someone else. Your heart's different when you go from use to serve. I'm not just using, I'm serving you with the spiritual gift. Now, this isn't on the screen. You're going to have to actually turn to your Bibles or your, or your, or your iPhone Bibles. you get there real quick. Well, Android, I, I can't help you. 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Now, remember, 1 Corinthians 12, we've been walking through it all month because 1 Corinthians 12 is where the Apostle Paul outlines the spiritual gifts. And then we jump over one chapter, put one finger in there, one chapter as soon as he ends his conversation about gifts, he starts to talk about love. But listen to what he said. In verse 1, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So you up here speaking in tongues, but you ain't saying nothing because your heart's toxic. So even though you're speaking in unknown tongues in other languages, it has no power because your heart's jacked up. So you can't do what God's asking you to do without love. And without humility, he keeps going, though. He said, if I had to get the prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, that's a lot of power. But didn't love others, I would be nothing. Can can stand 10 tones down, flat-footed, prophesy somebody's whole life. I've seen it. But you don't even love that person you're prophesying to. You can hear God with crystal clarity. Precision with your word. But if your heart is void of humility. If your heart is void of love, your Bible says that even your accurate prophecy is pointless. It serves no kingdom value. That's why you got to handle this with care. Because you could be helping, but if you're also gossiping, Your gift is null and void. You could have the gift of administration. And you could be, in one sense, building a department or building a team. But you're also backbiting the leader above you in a text message to another member of the church. Your gift has become null and void, even though it's in use, even though it's accurate, even though it's consistent, it's powerless. The apostle, he said, even if I prophesy with full accuracy, I have all the knowledge that God wanted to deliver If I deliver that word with no love, the Bible says I'm nothing. I wonder how many of us are in operation, but it's leading to nothing. I wonder how many of us are deploying our gifts, but it's yielding no results. 
could it be a heart issue? Maybe it's not a gift issue. Maybe there's some work in your heart that God wants to do. My suggestion would be to surrender. You don't want to be the type to get there and say, Lord, I did this. Lord, I did this. Lord, I did this. And he say, I never knew you. What is he talking about? You probably were doing a bunch of stuff, but you were doing it with a wrong heart. I never knew you. Be careful. Handle this with care. Make sure that you're using your gifts, but that you're using it with humility. Make sure that you're deploying your gifts, but you're deploying it with a heart full of love. You're not in your text voiding your gift. You're not on Facebook voiding your gift. You're not on phone calls voiding your gift. Because God's keeping track. Heaven knows. I don't want you just doing, but I want your doing to yield a result. And the best way to do that is to maintain a heart full of humility and a heart full of love. You're going to have to overcome some challenges in this journey, I promise you, because you're human. You're human. It's going to be challenging, one, not to let fear stop you from using your gift. Two, not letting pride overtake your gift. It's going to be challenging because you're human. So how do we make sure that we overcome these inherent challenges? Is we continue to stay before God's presence. We continue to bow to him. We continue to send. That's why the Bible says, pick up that cross every day. <laughs> every day is a choice. You have to keep, keep it before him. Don't let fear stop you like some of you are right now. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. So therefore, it's the devil tricking you to stay out of position. You got to understand, we're the body. We need you in position. We need you in operation. We need your heart right. If you don't, if you don't develop a sense of surrender daily, it's going to be hard for you to overcome these challenges. Make sure that you just lay it down every morning. Every time that you wake up, you got to crucify your flesh. The Bible says it daily. Because every time you wake up, you got a new set of flesh waiting to corrupt. And it only gets more challenging when you get activated in your gifts because you start thinking you somebody. It's the human nature. And you got to kill it over and over again. Here's how you do it. Remember what God has already given you. Remember what God has already given you. Remember what God has already given you. He's already given you a purpose. You got to find it, figure out, live in it. But he's already given it to you. He's already surrounded you with people to help you on your journey. You got to find them, but they're there. You're not alone like the devil wants you to believe. But you're going to have to be intentional with remembering, remembering how God has already purposed you. The Bible says he knew you in your mother's womb. Remember, because the devil's going to be lying to you, thinking he's going to give you your sin resume. Who are you going to, how are you going to lay hands on somebody? You remember how are you going to prophesy? You remember? Don't let him lie to you. Instead of letting him tell you, remind you of your wrongs, remind yourself of what God says about you. 
that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are more than a conqueror. Read your Bible every day. This is not religious. This is necessary. I don't care if it's one verse. You need daily bread. Because every day we're fed the culture. You don't take no days off from receiving your bread from the culture. That's why it's even more imperative today in this information age, in this technologically advanced age that we live in, that we read our Bibles every day. How are we going to use a gift on behalf, on behalf of a God we don't know? You're going to end up in the wrong spot. Read your Bible every day. Last thing before we go. If you want to serve well, if you want to use your gifts in a way that God has established them to be used, you need to reignite your prayer life. You can't do this apart from prayer. You cannot grow in Christ without maintaining contact with God. You need to talk, communicate, receive instructions, get the wisdom, get the strength that you need that can only come from your prayer life. If you try to operate in these gifts, if you try to handle these gifts apart from a prayer life that is consistent, a prayer life that is purified, a prayer life that happens over and over again in all situations and seasons, you're going to end up confused, consumed, and corrupted by your gifts. But when you do, pray. When you come to him on a regular basis, it becomes easier to operate in your gifts. You have way more understanding situation to situation. Am I supposed to speak or am I supposed to pray? Am I supposed to help or am I supposed to fall back? Because just because you have the gift of helps don't mean you're supposed to help everybody. That's another message for another day. But you need discernment, which is also a spiritual gift, to know how to operate these gifts well. You got to understand, this, this topic is necessary for your walk. You are not Batman with a tool belt. You just pull out what makes sense depending on the enemy. No, no. God gave you a spiritual gift, and he wants you to use it on a regular basis. But he wants you and I to be careful with how we use it. Let's stand. Handle it with care. Care about your spiritual gift and then handle it with caution as though it is precious to you. I guess maybe that's step one. You got to figure out how do I, how do I get myself to the place where I see the preciousness of this gift. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a chance for a business opportunity. No. It's not a chance for a career pivot. No, it's a precious gift that God in my hand. And I'm going to make sure that I handle it carefully. 